Chapter Three, Part Two of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Handsome Fishwoman, Part Two. Then Florent saw that he was in for it and realized that a spirit of insubordination was let loose among these people. He controlled himself, beckoned to one of the porters who carried the barrow for refuse, picked up the skate himself, and threw it in mother mahoudin put her arms akimbo with a defiant air and la belle normande laughed again as florent walked away each day there was a new invention the inspector was obliged to watch what was going on about him as if he had been in an enemy's land one morning when he ran to separate two women who were quarrelling he was near receiving full in his face a quantity of small fish which were certainly thrown at him he at once concluded that the quarrel was a farce acted for the benefit of la belle normande who sneered aloud his old training as a teacher armed him with angelic patience he knew how to preserve an appearance of impassibility even when he was boiling with indignation but none of his pupils were as ferocious as these women whose enormous busts shook with laughter when he was taken in some new snare gavard would have enjoyed all this and would have fought his way through in triumph but florent was always more or less intimidated by women and the rough coarseness of these especial ones was intensely disagreeable to him he had one friend among them all and this was claire she declared that she liked the new inspector and greeted him always with a cordial smile he very often saw her with her blonde hair curling on her neck and on her temples and her skirts carelessly tucked up as she dabbled in her tanks and gave fresh water to her fish he always thought of pictures he had seen of bathers on a riverside with their clothes loosely huddled about them one morning she was particularly amiable she called the inspector to see an enormous eel that had astonished the whole market she lifted the grating she had prudently laid over the top of the tank at the bottom of which the eel seemed to sleep wait a moment she said i will show you she softly put her arm in an arm that was a little thin on which the blue veins stood out on the satiny skin when the eel was touched it rolled over Claire said she had always been afraid of eels and could never bear to touch them, but now she had learned to hold them so they could not slip away, and she leaned over the tank and let the water drip from her fingers. "'I must show you my carp,' she said suddenly, and opening another tank she lifted out a superb creature. "'They do not bite,' she said with her sweet smile, "'but I am afraid of crabs.' As she said this she took from a box nearby a crab but cautious as she was the creature evidently took a stronger nip than she anticipated for she grew very red and broke off the claw angrily although she did not cease to smile i would never trust a pike though they will take off your fingers as if with a knife and she pointed to a long row of pike arranged by their sizes the air was full of odours like those rising from a pond wherein grow water lilies and tall reeds she dried her hands on her apron and smiled again claire's sympathy was but a small consolation to florent for it only attracted a great deal of observation and caused many disagreeable remarks whenever he stopped near her stall the revolt in the market became each day more decided florent would have left the market but for his fear of seeming a coward in lisa's eyes i would soon bring them to their senses said she one day after dinner you are wrong to be so mild florent take a decided step and you will soon bring them to terms one morning madame taboureau's cook was in the fish market looking for a barbel come and see me said la belle normande and i can find you something just lift that she continued laying in the woman's hand a barbel wrapped in yellow paper the servant regretfully said but how much is it fifteen francs answered the fishwoman the servant laid the fish down and turned away what will you give then name your price no no it is too dear I can't give more than eight francs. Then Mother Mahoudin came to the fore. Did the woman think they had stolen their fish? And La Belle Normande turned away her head. The woman came back and offered nine and then ten francs. And as she was going away for good, La Belle Normande called out, Well, then, give me the money. The cook stood talking with Mother Mahoudin. Madame Taboureau was so particular she had company to dinner that day a cousin from blois a lawyer and his wife you are going to clean that fish are you not she said interrupting herself la belle normande emptied the fish with one quick movement of her fingers 
wiped the sand out under the grills and laid the fish on the cook's basket there now she said gaily you are all right in fifteen minutes the cook was back she had been crying she threw the fish on the marble slab showing a great tear in the belly a flood of tears choked her words madame tabourot won't have it she says she can't use it and that i am a fool who allows myself to be robbed by everybody i did not turn it over i trusted you give me back my ten francs mother mehuden rose in her wrath do you think she said that we shall take it back you must have let the fish fall the servant burst into tears you are two thieves she sobbed just as my mistress said the mother and daughter were furious and the little cook sobbed still harder your mistress would like us to mend this for her i suppose sneered la belle normande florent arrived in the height of this quarrel which had attracted all the women from the various stalls as soon as he heard the story he promptly said give back the ten francs to this woman but mother mehuden meant to go to the length of her rope of course she cried and this is the way i shall give them to her and the old woman flung the fish full in the little cook's face this was too much for florent even la belle normande was thunderstruck as he exclaimed i shall withdraw your permit for a week and as he heard a loud hiss behind him he turned with so threatening an air that even la belle normande was afraid and recoiled when the mehudens had returned the ten francs he closed the stall the old woman was choking with rage while her daughter was cold and white could it be possible that she la belle normande was ignominiously turned out of her stall claire said quite audibly that it served her right which led to a fierce quarrel that night between the two sisters at the end of a week when the mehudens returned to the market they were very quiet and silent but from this time la belle normande cherished the hope of some terrible revenge she felt that the blow came to her through lisa who had given her so triumphant a glance the day after the battle that her rival swore she should pay dearly for it her child was growing up in the fish market at home in every corner of it and among the shining mackerel and perch his favourite amusement when his mother's back was turned was to build walls and houses with the herring he also drew them up in a line of battle on the marble slab imitated a trumpet with his lips and then pushed them all together in a pile crying out that they were dead then he tormented his aunt claire and did his best to drown himself in her tank at seven he was the idol of the fish market and did precisely as he pleased when they showed him something which he considered absolutely entrancing he would clasp his hands and say ah it is too much and the name of much clung to him much was here much was there and everywhere he loved the running water like any fish and paddled about in it all the time often stealthily opening a faucet overjoyed at the spurting forth of the water and his mother would pick him up many times in the day wet through and through and blue with cold much at seven was as beautiful a child as was ever seen his chestnut hair lightly waved his eyes were as blue as forget-me-nots all the frightful language of the hall fell naturally from the lips which looked so pure he would put his arms akimbo and imitate his grandmother to perfection all the time looking like the smiling christ on the knees of the virgin the fishwomen nearly killed themselves laughing and he thus encouraged generally wound up his sentences with an oath but he was charming because he was ignorant of the enormity of the words he uttered winter came much was very chilly that year and took a great fancy to the inspector's office which was furnished with a table an iron safe a sofa two armchairs and a stove it was by this stove that much delighted to establish himself florent adored children and whenever he saw the boy wistfully looking through the window he bade him enter the first words uttered by much astonished him somewhat it is devilish cold he said in his baby voice and then with a laugh which sounded like water running out of a narrow-necked bottle he added do you really go every night to warm my aunt claire's feet florent found a strange fascination in this child la belle normande did not interfere although she was herself very reserved and florent cherished the idea finally of bringing the little fellow up in a better way 
he fancied himself back again with his brother Quenu in the old room in la rue royer collard he found infinite pleasure in the companionship of this young creature to whom he taught the alphabet at once much showed the quick intelligence of the child of parisian streets he liked to look at pictures he liked the warmth of the stove on which he could roast potatoes and chestnuts but of this last he soon wearied and he stole from his aunt claire white bait which he hung on a string and ate when roasted without bread one day he brought a carp but this was too much for florent who put an end to the cooking at the end of two months much could read and his copy-book was by no means bad in the evening at home the child talked incessantly of his dear friend florent who could draw trees and men in huts the normande therefore lived so to speak in the intimate companionship of the man whom she would gladly have strangled she went so far one day as to lock much in that he might not go to his friends but the child wailed so vociferously that she was glad to let him out she was in reality anything but firm in spite of her determined airs and when the child told her how happy he had been she felt a vague sensation of gratitude and later she was more moved when he read to her a paragraph from a newspaper which had wrapped a loaf of bread and by degrees she came to the conclusion though she did not say so that perhaps florent was not such a bad man after all she felt for him a certain respect and no small curiosity she therefore suddenly decided that it would be much better fun to be amiable to the cousin than to quarrel with him and would make the fat lisa much madder what does your friend say of me she asked much one morning as she was dressing him nothing at all well then tell him i am much obliged for his teaching you to read henceforward the child always had a message to carry from the inspector to his mother or from his mother to the inspector la belle normande walked into the inspector's office one day while much was taking his writing lesson she was very gentle and very complimentary while florent was far more embarrassed than she they talked only of the child as there was some difficulty in continuing the lessons at the office she asked him to come to her in the evening then there was some question on her part of remuneration which he promptly refused she laughed and said that she should pay with her finest fish then thus was peace established la belle normande even took florent under her protection the inspector was accepted from that moment in the market the fishwoman saying that he was far better than his predecessor mother mahoudin was the only one who rebelled under this new dispensation she still retained malice against this man of whom she spoke in the most contemptuous terms one morning when florent stopped at claire's stall she turned away petulantly and would not speak to him he was so surprised that he spoke of it to la belle normande never mind she said claire is always contrary and does this only to make me angry she had triumphed and went to her stall each day more coquettish in her costume and with her hair more elaborately dressed when she met la belle lisa she looked at her with disdain she even laughed in her face the certainty she felt of annoying her old friend by taking away the cousin put her in the best of spirits at this time she took it into her head to dress much with more care in scotch plaids and a velvet cap for much had gone about in rags unfortunately it was about this time that the affection of much for water developed itself more strongly the ice had broken the weather was warmer and he took his usual bath from the faucets arrayed in his new garments his mother surprised him just as he had placed some small fish which he had stolen from his aunt claire in his velvet cap and sent them swimming down the gutter florent lived eight months in the halle these eight months after his seven long years of suffering were as a peaceful slumber his simple little office pleased him with its quiet and solitude but after those eight months had elapsed he became a little restless he was filled with a vague dissatisfaction at the emptiness of his existence and this dissatisfaction was rapidly growing into a certain nervous excitement every day was like its fellow he was surrounded by the same odours and by the same noises through the hoarse cries of the auctioneers in the market he heard the ringing of the distant bells sometimes he was detained in the markets until noon arranging the endless quarrels and disputes he saw huge baskets of cooked lobsters and gloved gentlemen lightly touching them 
further on were the women of the quartier bareheaded bargaining for their fish sometimes he caught sight of a lady followed by a servant in her long white apron his inspection always ended at the stalls which displayed the herring and the sardines from nantes on their beds of green leaves in the afternoon the markets were quiet and he shut himself up in his office and enjoyed the most agreeable hours of the day the fishwomen sat knitting behind their counters waiting on an occasional customer who came late hoping for a better bargain when night came the fish were all put away on beds of ice then florent was free to go home he carried away with him the smell of the fish in his clothing at first he did not suffer from this but as the spring came in it became very disagreeable to him and in time the smell from the fish market grew absolutely insupportable it seemed to him that he was haunted by the smell of food in his home as well as in his office it followed him through closed doors and windows sometimes in his restlessness he went down the wide stairs into the cellars dimly lighted by gas where the air though a little close was cool and uncontaminated by the smell which was especially obnoxious to him he stood by the side of the great tank in which the supplies of fish were held in reserve he listened to the incessant soft drip of water falling from the four corners of the central urn and this noise calmed him he was not at home either with the people their roughness galled him the women worried him he was only at ease with madame francois she was so heartily glad at his having found a situation that he was quite touched lisa and la belle normande made him uncomfortable with their laughs and significant looks but madame francois was different she laughed too but her laugh was sympathetic besides she was a courageous creature and bore her hard life well florent saw her struggling through the storm just at daybreak with the wheels of her wagon covered with mud up to the hubs and balthazar's very belly encrusted from the heavy roads between nanterre and paris the animal was always caressed and pitied rubbed off with straw and polished down with an old apron we have to be careful about colics she said ah poor old balthazar when we came over the bridge at neuilly you thought you were going down into the seine did you not it poured then balthazar went to the inn but she poor woman sat in the rain and sold her vegetables the sidewalk was a sea of liquid mud the vegetables had none of the beauty that was theirs on sunny mornings and the vendor swore at the administration which refused to build them a roof on the ground that rain did not hurt vegetables no matter how merciless the rain might be however never did florent find madame francois out of temper or discouraged she shook herself occasionally like a water-dog and said she was neither sugar nor salt and should not melt he insisted sometimes on her going into le bigre's where they drank some hot wine her friendly face enchanted him and the smell of the woods and fields which hung about her refreshed him you must come to nanterre my boy she said you must see my kitchen garden never did you behold such time as mine and never did i smell anything so nasty as your paris and off she went with the water dripping from her at every step leaving florent cheered and encouraged he worked hard as in this way he kept within bounds the nervous energy which was his characteristic he was also very methodical and he shut himself up two evenings in the week to write his great work on cayenne he lighted his fire saw that the plants at the foot of his bed were sheltered from its heat and seating himself at his table worked until midnight he had pushed the prayer-book to the back of the drawer which had become full by degrees of notes and slips of paper and all sorts of manuscript the work on cayenne made no rapid advance as it was constantly interfered with by other projects he had in his mind a plan which would revolutionize the hal a new way of estimating the taxes and finally another plan as yet a little confused in detail a humanitarian law by which a certain amount of the vast supply of food which poured daily into paris would find its way to every household with bowed head he bent over his work in the soft subdued light of his attic occasionally a chaffinch which he had picked up one snowy day in the market deluded by the idea that the light meant morning would utter a few clear notes this and his pen running over the paper were the only sounds in the room unfortunately florent hankered after politics they had cost him so dearly that they naturally became most precious to him 
he under certain circumstances would have become a teacher in some little provincial town and been quite happy in his metier but he had been treated like a wild beast and he looked upon himself as consecrated by his exile to some great struggle his nervous restlessness was but the reaction from the long torpor of cayenne from the bitterness caused by his unmerited sufferings by his oath to avenge the injustice from which he and all humanity in him had suffered he began to look on the hal as a great animal digesting a tremendous meal around him were solid figures and round faces offering a continual protest against his pallid face and emaciated form they seemed to say that peaceable people could grow fat and be comfortable he with clenched hands brooded over his wrongs until he became more irritated at the remembrance of his exile than he was at the time of his return to france he would drop his pen and think the dying fire lighted up his face and his lamp smoked while the bird with his head under his wing quietly slept sometimes auguste seeing a light under his door would knock and ask to come in florent opened the door with some impatience the young man would take a chair in front of the fire saying little and giving no explanation of why he had come all the time his eyes were fixed on the photograph of himself and augustine florent finally came to the conclusion that he liked to come to this room merely because his fiancée had once lived there one evening he asked with a smile if he had not guessed aright perhaps answered auguste in surprise the question having explained his own feelings to himself i did not think of it and if i should tell augustine so she would only laugh he said when he talked at all it was about the eating-house which he intended to establish with augustine at plassan he seemed so secure of his future that florent felt a certain respect for him as for any fellow-creature who went straight to his aim on such evenings florent was more discontented than usual and only recovered his equilibrium when he had said to himself over and over again but this auguste is a perfect brute each month he went to clamart to see m valoque the poor man lingered along much to the astonishment of gavard at each visit made by florent the invalid declared that he was better and almost ready to resume work florent sat by the side of the bed and tried to cheer him he laid on the table the fifty francs which he had agreed to give up and each time valoc insisted he would not take the money then they talked of other things and the money still lay there when florent went away madame valoc followed him to the door she was pale and small and very sad she spoke of the frightful expense attendant on her husband's illness the beef tea the bordeaux and the medicines and as tears filled the poor woman's eyes florent begged her to accept some assistance from him without her husband's knowledge she accepted fifty francs but during the month she often wrote to him calling him her saviour filling three pages with her gratitude and ending by asking for ten francs finally the whole salary went to the valoc menage the husband probably knew nothing of it and the wife was pitifully humble this good action was his great joy he concealed it as if it were something to be ashamed of florent's needs were small for he had no expenses at his brother's after a short time his life was as regular as a clock he worked in his attic two evenings taught little much two others from eight to nine spent one evening with lisa and the rest of his time with gavard and his friends at the restaurant his duties as a teacher at the mahoudans were not especially easy but the old house pleased him the lower rooms were occupied by a man who sold cooked vegetables the sharp smell of which greeted him as soon as the door opened the mahoudans occupied the whole of the second story the old mother would never consent to move notwithstanding the entreaties of her two daughters who wanted one of the new houses in the wide streets but all in vain she said she had lived there and there she would die she contented herself however with a dark room leaving the better chambers to claire and la normande the latter with the authority of an elder sister took the one overlooking the street which was really a fine room claire was so displeased at this that she refused to occupy the adjoining one which opened on the courtyard and took as her own a sort of garret on the other side of the stairs herein when she was displeased she locked herself and was deaf to all sounds from without when florent presented himself the mahoudans had just finished dinner much jumped into his arms and when the shining oilcloth was wiped down the lessons began on a corner of the table 
la belle normande greeted him warmly she knitted or mended under the light of the same lamp and often dropped her needle to listen to the lesson she soon had a great esteem for this man who was so well informed and was at the same time endowed with such angelic patience she did not think him in the least ugly now do please mamma push your chair farther back said the child angrily just see this blot by degrees she insinuated a few words against la belle lisa she declared that she concealed her age that she laced so tightly she could not breathe and that the reason she always came down in the morning without a hair out of place was because she was so hideous in dishabille and then she raised her arms above her head to show that she wore no corsets her figure was superb and every undulation was to be seen under her loose camisole the lesson was interrupted much was quite interested in seeing his mother lift her arms in this way florent laughed and thought women were strange creatures the rivalry of lisa and la belle normande amused him much in the meantime finished his copy florent set others on slips of paper he particularly affected the words tyrannical anti-constitutional revolutionary and he made the child copy phrases like these the day of justice will come when the hour strikes the guilty will fall he did this mechanically merely setting down the ideas which were in his brain he forgot much la belle normande and all his surroundings much copied everything filling long pages with unconstitutional and tyrannically at this time mother mahoudin was wandering around the table grumbling she was by no means kindly disposed toward florent she said it was absolute folly to set the child at work at this hour when children ought to be asleep in their beds she would certainly have shown the lank fellow to the door if her daughter had not fiercely declared that she would leave the house if she could not receive in it such friends as she chose nevertheless the dispute recommenced each evening i tell you said the old woman that he has a treacherous eye and then i never trust thin men he is as flat as a board he has no insides i do really believe she talked in this way because she saw how things were going she spoke with admiration of m lebigre who at this time was very gallant toward la belle normande he not only smelt a good dowry but he thought of her beauty which would be such an addition to his counter but la normande shrugged her shoulders and turned away when her mother persisted she said angrily let me alone will you i shall do as i please and going out of the room she slammed the door she abused the ascendancy she had acquired in the house but her mother distrusted her to that point that when she heard a noise in the night she crept to her daughter's door to ascertain if florent were not there but florent had a bitterer enemy even than she in the house as soon as he entered the room claire rose without a word took a candle and went to her own attic and they heard her lock her door with a snap one night her sister asked the inspector to dinner and claire at hers in the passageway she sometimes was not seen for a week and when she came out her eyes were restless and suspicious as florent one evening was going away he passed claire's door which was wide open he saw her turn very red as he glanced at her this hostile attitude on her part saddened him and only the timidity he always felt toward women prevented him from asking an explanation he hesitated but catching a glimpse of mademoiselle saget's pale face looking down from the upper landing he went on he had not gone ten steps when he heard claire's door violently closed from that time mademoiselle saget declared that madame quenu's cousin had led both the mahoudan women astray florent rarely thought of them except when they were before his eyes his manner toward women was that of a man who has never had any success with them he expended too much of his virility in dreaming he liked la belle normande in a friendly sort of way she was good-hearted even if she did allow her temper to run away with her sometimes but when she drew her chair close to him and looked over the book he held he was uncomfortable about her hair and skirts clung always a smell of the sea her magnificent figure and clear-cut features gave her the air of an antique statue which had been lying at the bottom of the sea and brought to the surface by some fisherman's net End of chapter three part two
Chapter Three, Part Three of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Handsome Fishwoman, Part Three. Laurent did not admire her especially. She was too large, too powerfully built to please him, in spite of Mademoiselle Saget's statement that he was her lover. The old maid had quarrelled with La Normande about a fish she had purchased, and immediately became very friendly toward La Belle Lisa and hoped in that way to make the acquaintance of florent who however contrived to escape her clutches the cousin excited her curiosity to the most extraordinary degree since he frequented the mahoudens she spent most of her time hanging over the railing of the staircase she knew that la belle lisa was by no means pleased to see florent go to these women and therefore went regularly to the eating-house to tell her all that was going on she put her hands on the counter as she talked she never bought anything but contented herself with saying over and over again he was there yesterday and la normande called him dear out in the corridor the day after she chose to believe that she had seen florent leaving claire's room she rushed into lisa's presence saying that it was a disgrace i saw it with my own eyes she declared he just goes from one to the other and there is the old mother sleeping in her room between the daughters i think it is simply scandalous lisa shrugged her shoulders she said little encouraging the old maid's gossip only by her silence when the allusions became broader she frowned and said under her breath no this will never do mademoiselle saget answered that all women were not as respectable as herself she ought to have found that out by this time she was too indulgent to the cousin a man of his age ought not to run after every petticoat was he married but lisa would never say a word about the cousin and when mademoiselle saget had gone immediately called to augustine to bring a cloth to rub off the spots left by the fingers of the little old woman on the shining marble it is disgusting she muttered the rivalry of la belle lisa and la belle normande became daily more aggressive the latter being quite sure that she had stolen lisa's lover each woman evinced her hostility according to her temperament one tranquil and contemptuous with the air of a woman who draws her skirts closely around her to keep them from contamination the other insolent loud and gay with the manner of a successful duellist who is eager for a prey their glances crossed each other like swords when la normande passed the eating-shop and lisa stood at the door when lisa went to the fish market she turned up her nose when she passed her rival's stall and bought at the next a turbot or a salmon to hear the rivals talk of each other one would believe that they sold spoiled fish and tainted meat they could see each other too from their respective places of business the great cow is up cried la belle normande she is pulling her corset lace as tight as if it were at the end of one of her big sausages at the same moment on the other side of the street lisa was saying to her assistant do you see that poor creature opposite she is losing all her good looks with the life she leads do you see her earrings it is a great pity for a girl like that to wear such expensive ones it is a great pity for the one who has to pay for them answered augustine complacently but in the afternoon the contest waged hotter la belle normande embroidered with the most delicate of needles this exasperated lisa who said she has best darn her boy's stockings with those red hands lisa was knitting as usual it is always the same stocking too remarked the other she eats so much that she falls asleep over her work the two women forbade their children to speak to each other pauline and much before this had been excellent friends the little girl with her fresh crisp skirts and the bare-legged boy paddling in the gutter one day when much came for pauline as usual lisa dismissed him as if he had been a beggar you cannot play with my child she said i could never have an easy moment he has such examples before him the child was only seven mademoiselle saget nodded her head sagaciously you are right he is thoroughly depraved he was found in the cellar the other day with one of the neighbour's little girls la belle normande when much ran to her weeping to tell her of his disappointment was perfectly furious she would have liked to break every pane of glass in lisa's windows but contented herself with whipping much if you ever go there again she raged you will have an account to settle with me 
the real victim of these two women was florent for they would never have quarrelled but for him it was he who had set them all by the ears for until his arrival they had lived in dull peace la belle lisa preserved the attitude toward her brother-in-law of a judge she showed him clearly that she utterly disapproved of his conduct but did her best not to show the jealousy she felt honest woman as she was and thorough as was her disdain of florent she never saw him leave the house to go to la rue pirouette without a pang the dinners at the quenus were less cheerful the excessive neatness of the dining-room became almost rigid florent hardly dared eat lest he should let a few crumbs fall on the floor lisa said with a smile one day it seems to me that you grow thinner and thinner in her tone there was something of the distrust which mother mehuden openly acknowledged feeling toward thin people and quenu hazarded more than one allusion to the dissipated life his brother was believed to lead lisa however never made the smallest allusion to la belle normande and one night when her name dropped from quenu's unwary lips she became so icy that he never repeated the offence lisa never spoke of florent to her husband she thought it unwise to make the smallest difference between the brothers unless absolutely necessary at this time she was very tolerant and avoided every allusion which could remind the inspector that he ate and drank with her without paying for the privilege but one day she said to quenu we are never alone now if you wish to speak to me you must wait until we go to bed and one evening as she was sewing she said to her husband why does not your brother buy himself some underwear i have been obliged to give him three old shirts of yours he never knows what he does with his money answered quenu and it is none of our business replied his wife only once did she lose her repose of manner la normande had presented florent with a fine salmon he did not know how to refuse nor what to do with it and finally carried it home to lisa suppose you make a pate of it he said ingenuously she looked at him with whitened lips then in a voice that she strove to render firm she answered do you think we are in need of food thank heaven we have enough to eat yet take it away will you not cook it for me asked florent amazed at her anger her anger burst forth do you think this house is a country inn tell the persons who gave it to you to cook it it shall not be done in my kettles or pans take it away i tell you he carried it to monsieur le bigre rose was told to make a pate of it and this pate was eaten the same evening m gavard adding some oysters to the feast by degrees florent gradually fell into the way of spending more time at the cabaret sometimes when he had established himself for a quiet evening's work in his attic the absolute quiet of the room grated upon him and he dropped everything and went off to listen to the sarcastic denunciations of charvet and to the bitter axioms of logre one evening logre having been more violent than usual brought his fist down on the table furiously and declared that if the men of to-day were worth anything they would pull down the government and he added that the day was not far off when this would be done and that they had best hold themselves in readiness heads were then drawn closely together voices were lowered and gavard from that day looked upon himself as belonging to a secret society a most dangerous organization discussions were renewed night after night for months then followed questions of organizations questions of ends and means questions of strategy and future government as soon as rose had served the party clemence included the doors were closed and the seance was opened charvet and florent were the two to whom the others naturally listened gavard could not hold his tongue however and little by little he told the story of cayenne and promoted florent to the distinction of a martyr and one night when some one said something against his friend who was absent he exclaimed do not attack florent he has been to cayenne but charvet was not abashed even by this distinction and he replied cayenne cayenne indeed it is not such a bad place after all he then tried to prove that exile was nothing that it was far worse to remain in a country oppressed by triumphant despotism he insisted that only simpletons were arrested on the second of december and seemed much out of temper however that he had not arrived at that distinction himself florent called himself a socialist and was supported by alexandre and lacaille as to gavard having been reproached for his fortune he more than once announced himself to be a communist 
the fact is said charvet in his decisive tone the trunk is rotten and it should be cut down yes answered logre standing up to make his ascent more imposing yes you are right he repeated pompously robin approved with a silent nod which became more frequent the more revolutionary the propositions became his eyes gleamed at the word guillotine he shut them partially and seemed to be looking at the thing itself and then he rubbed his chin with a gentle purr of satisfaction i think said florent in a voice which had a tone of sadness i think that the tree should be preserved to graft upon it a new life it is time now to think of the workmen our movement should be a social one and i defy you to restrain the people from advancing their claims they will have their share now they are weary of standing back these words filled alexandre with wild enthusiasm yes he cried that is true all revolutions said lacaille have been for the middle classes we must have our turn but exclaimed charvet do you expect me to fight for the workmen if they refuse to fight for me but after all that is not the question france cannot be accustomed to the exercise of liberty without ten years of revolutionary dictatorship particularly said clemence in a low distinct tone as the workman is not mature and needs guidance she spoke but rarely this strange grave quiet woman listened like any man to these political discussions she sat leaning against the wall looking from one to the other of the speakers with a nod of assent or a frown of disapproval which proved that she fully understood what was said and that she had moreover decided opinions on the most complicated subjects sometimes she rolled a cigarette and smoked it slowly and contemplatively she had the air of sitting in judgment and looked as if she had prizes to distribute at the end she evidently thought it due to her position as a woman to reserve her opinion and not mingle in the discussions sometimes however in the heat of them she uttered a word or two and struck the nail on the head to use gavard's expression or put the climax to something which charvet had said the truth was that she thought herself far cleverer than any of these men with the exception of robin whom she respected for his silence laurent like the other men paid very little attention to clemence whom in fact they regarded as one of themselves they shook her hand as if they would loosen her arm from its socket one evening florent heard her and charvet talking over her accounts charvet asked her to lend him ten francs but she said no that they must first know just how they stood they lived together on the basis of freedom both in love and money each paid his expenses strictly and thus were slaves to no man the rent food washing and amusements were all divided and this evening clemence proved to charvet that he already owed her five francs she then gave him the ten for which he asked saying remember you now owe me fifteen you must pay me when you get your money for little lehudier's lessons when rose was summoned to receive the money due from the little circle clemence was laughed at because she ordered a glass of grog charvet said she did it to humiliate him because he earned less than she although he laughed he felt this fact keenly and inwardly protested against it in spite of his theory of the equality of the sexes if these discussions amounted to little they at least exercised the lungs of these gentlemen sometimes they talked so loudly that rose serving some blouse at the counter would cast an uneasy glance toward the closed door they are quarrelling in there said the blouse wiping his mouth on the back of his hand no danger answered m lebigre quietly it is only gentlemen talking lebigre who was strict enough with his other customers let these talk and shout as much as they pleased without any interference from him he sat for hours on his soft cushioned chair sleepily watching rose uncork her bottles and wipe her glasses but no matter how sleepy he was he always rose when the discussions in the private room became at all loud and placed himself where he could hear what was said and sometimes even he after a light tap on the door knocked and went in and gavard himself said that le bigre could be relied on if troubles came but one morning at market when florent interfered between rose and a fishwoman in a tremendous quarrel that took place a propos of some herring he heard the latter call rose the spy's mistress and the dirty rag of the prefecture when peace was established he went about quietly and informed himself as far as he was able in regard to le bigre one said that he had been on the police force another said that he was a usurer 
and lent to the market people at the most fearful rate of interest florent was much disturbed and that same evening he in a low voice told his friends what he had heard his discourse was received with derision poor florent said charvet maliciously because he has been at cayenne he always thinks the police are at his heels gavard gave his word of honour that le bigre was honest and honourable but logre was very angry he twisted himself on his chair until it cracked and said that it was a little too much to hear these constant suggestions of the police for his part he would rather stay at home and think no more of politics had he not been transported twice he looked so ferocious that the others nodded in assent but lacaille when he heard the word usurer turned away his head in fact the plot made but little progress at the beginning of the summer florent had been somewhat distrustful but had now begun to believe in the possibility of some revolutionary movement he occupied himself with the idea quite seriously taking notes and drawing up plans he even induced his brother to accompany him to the cabaret one evening with the feeling that he was still his pupil and should be now launched in politics quenu liked this new experience he liked the noise he liked the novelty of the presence of a woman in such a place la belle lisa noticed his haste to leave home in the evening she said nothing but when he and florent went away she stood at her door and saw them enter the cabaret with stormy eyes and compressed lips mademoiselle saget one evening recognized quenu's shadow on the ground glass windows of the private room which looked out on la rue pirouette she had found an excellent post of observation where she soon learned to know every shadow sometimes she felt as if she might find out something more tangible if she were on the spot so she took her cordial bottle on the pretence that she must take something the first thing in the morning she made rose wash her bottle in order to spend more time at the counter but at last she could find no further excuse for delay and she reluctantly turned to leave when she heard quenu say in a childish tone it is high time that these deputies and ministers should be put down before eight o'clock the next morning mademoiselle saget was at lisa's she found la sarriette and madame lecoeur there buying hot sausages for their breakfast as the little old maid had drawn them into her quarrel with la belle normande they naturally became quite intimate with lisa they declared that the fishwoman was abominable and that florent was getting tired of managing the two and was handing one of them over to his friend gavard the four went often to supper at barat's on the especial morning of which we write the old maid had prepared a blow for la belle lisa i saw monsieur quenu she said in her sweetest voice they have a good time those gentlemen in that private room where they make so much noise lisa did not choose to look as if she heard but in reality not a word escaped her mademoiselle saget went on they had a woman with them oh not monsieur quenu i don't say it was he for i don't know it was clemence interrupted la sarriette she puts on such airs just because she was educated at a boarding-school she lives with a ragged professor i have seen them together many a time i know said the old maid who had known all the time and merely wished to disturb lisa who however looked as placid as usual she seemed interested in something that was going on in the market then the other tried again and addressing madame lecoeur she said if i were you i would advise my brother-in-law to be prudent they say the most awful things in that room men really seem to have no sense with their politics if they should be heard things might go hard with them gavard does as he chooses sighed madame lecoeur but this is the drop too much anxiety will soon use me up entirely oh answered mademoiselle saget it will do no harm so long as only a safe person like myself hears them but last night when monsieur quenu said she stopped lisa had certainly started monsieur quenu said that all the ministers and deputies ought to be shot lisa turned around she was very pale did quenu say that she asked yes and much more that i cannot remember but there is no harm done for as i say it was only i who heard him and you know that i am as safe as possible i know too how much harm such words might do a man it is between ourselves entirely lisa was herself again she was too proud to allow these people to see that there was the smallest cloud between herself and her husband she smiled faintly and said 
it is all nonsense my dear woman when the three women were on the sidewalk they agreed that lisa looked extremely discomfited and they thought there would be trouble soon among these people madame lecoeur asked what was done with people who were arrested for political reasons the old maid said she had no idea she only knew that they were never seen again la sarriette whereupon jauntily remarked that perhaps they were thrown into the seine that day at breakfast and dinner lisa made no remarks nor when in the evening her husband went away with florent that night the discussion was so interesting that it was prolonged until after midnight quenu went home with rather an uneasy conscience he opened the three or four doors of his house as softly as possible and crossed the salon on tiptoe on entering his bedroom he was annoyed to see that lisa had left a candle burning as he took off his boots the clock struck half-past one with a clear ringing sound which was so loud that he started and turned a glance of reproach upon the shining gutenberg he could only see lisa's back she lay with her head buried in her pillows but he knew she was not asleep that her eyes were wide open and fixed on the wall her large shoulders were eloquent with restrained anger quenu considerably disconcerted by the silent reproach of her attitude blew out the candle and slipped into bed lying on its very edge finally he fell asleep not daring to say good night the next day he slept late when he awoke he lay for a few minutes looking at lisa who was seated before her secretary putting her papers in order he summoned all his courage and said from over the eiderdown coverings why did you not wake me before what are you doing putting my drawers in order she answered he felt the weight lifted from his shoulders but she added you can't tell what may happen if the police should come the police did you say yes certainly are you occupied with politics now he raised himself considerably startled by this unexpected attack i do not care a sou for politics he said the police won't come here i fancy for i shall not compromise myself no indeed answered lisa with a shrug of the shoulders you merely wish to shoot everybody i i yes and you shout this out at a second-rate cabaret mademoiselle saget heard you say it all the whole quartier know by this time that you are a red he pulled the sheets over his head he was not more than half awake he shivered as if he already heard the gendarmes at the door of his room he looked at her with her hair dressed as usual her well-fitting gown was the one she always wore and vaguely wondered at finding her so correct under these dramatic circumstances you know she continued that i leave you absolutely free she went on sorting her papers i have no desire to rule you are the master you can ruin us it is my duty to look out for pauline he protested but she silenced him with a gesture i do not wish to quarrel she said had you asked my advice she rose and went from the bed to the window and back again to her desk from which she brushed a few grains of dust for my part i am grateful to the government our business is prosperous and i eat my dinner quietly and sleep undisturbed by cannon how was it in forty eight uncle gradel showed us on his books how he lost over six thousand francs at that time now that we have the empire all is prosperous what more do you want how will you be any better off when you have shot everybody she stood with her arms folded looking at quenu who disappeared entirely he put out his head at last and essayed an explanation but became hopelessly involved in the political and social systems of charvet and florent he spoke of the future of the democracy of the regeneration of society in such confused terms that lisa shrugged her shoulders in despair he finally attacked the empire it was the reign of utter profligacy of theft by mailed hands you see he said repeating a phrase he had caught from logre we are at the mercy of a band of adventurers who are devastating france we must have done with them very well and what then you are not obliged to assassinate pillage or steal and what do we care what other people do she was quite magnificent as she walked up and down the room in stately fashion if the government does vile things she continued i do not wish to know it gavard says that the emperor is a bad man and that he is mixed up in some scandalous stories this may be true probably is but that need not prevent your voting for him for he does not ask you to lend him money 
and you have only to let the government understand that you are satisfied in the prosperity of your business listen to me and she seated herself on the edge of the bed do you want your shop pillaged do you want your cellar emptied and your money taken do you think that if these men at m lebigre's triumph that you will be as comfortable as you are now no indeed then why do you talk so lightly of upsetting a government which has given you this protection you have a wife and a daughter your first duty is to them you have no right to risk their happiness there are plenty of people without a roof over their heads who can risk their lives as much as they please but as for you my dear simple husband you had best make yourself comfortable eat well sleep well and keep an easy conscience france does not need you she laughed and quenu was entirely convinced that she was right and that she was a very pretty woman he looked around the room and his eyes fell on their portraits which had quite an air of distinction he thought the chamber too was quite imposing the squares of guipure gave an air of respectability to the chairs the carpets and curtains had a most comfortable aspect and he seemed to himself to have risked the loss of all these at m lebigre's now said his wife you must promise to meddle no more with politics sustain the government to the extent of your ability and when you are old you will live in peace on your income can you again assented it is gavard he murmured the smile faded from her face no it is not gavard i know who it is he should be sure of his own safety before he compromises others do you mean florent asked quenu timidly she did not reply at once but turned away to the secretary then she said in quick decided tones yes i mean florent you know i am very patient on no consideration would i come between you and your brother the ties of blood are sacred but the truth is that ever since your brother came things have gone from bad to worse no i will not say any more there was a long silence and as quenu looked in a dazed sort of way at the ceiling she continued with more violence he seems to have no idea either of the sacrifices we make for him he has augustine's chamber and the poor girl has to sleep in a closet without a breath of air we feed him and supply all his needs and he accepts everything as a matter of course he makes money but we see none of it you know we have his inheritance in our business Quenu timidly observed lisa looked as if she were stunned her anger fell you are right she said slowly we have his inheritance and the account is in that drawer he would not have it as you remember which proves the truth of my words that he is a fellow without any sense if he had been in the least practical he would have done something with that money i did not want it i spoke to him several times but he would not hear me i wish you would compel him to take it quenu uttered a groan lisa dropped that point no he is not like any person i ever saw before she continued i say this merely because we are talking about him i should not trouble myself about what he did or where he went were it not that the whole quartier are talking about him but i tell you positively that if he is going to meddle with politics again and proposes to involve you that i shall get rid of him at once i warn you and i hope you understand florent was condemned she made a strong effort to control herself and not allow her husband to suspect the flood of bitterness which filled her soul she went on he worries me she said he frightens me besides he smells of fish and i can't eat a mouthful when he is at the table he eats though but why does he not grow fat passes my comprehension she went to the window as she spoke and caught a glimpse of her brother-in-law just entering the market and the look with which she followed him was that of a combatant of a woman who is resolved to triumph when she turned quenu had risen he was pale and shivering not from cold but with grief at the lack of harmony between his wife and his brother but lisa smiled and handed him his slippers which courtesy touched him greatly End of chapter three Chapter Four, Part One of the Markets of Paris by Emile Zola. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chickweed for the Little Birds, Part One. Marjolaine was found in the Marché des Innocents among a pile of cabbages. No one ever knew what wretched hands had put him there. 
he was about three years old when he was found fat and happy but so dull or backward that he did not speak one word when a woman turning over the cabbages suddenly beheld him under a huge white cabbage she uttered a little shriek and he stretched out his arms to her the whole day long the market talked of him he laughed all day and ate whatever was given him the woman who first saw him kept him a month she then passed him on to another and then to another when any one said to him where is your mother he made a droll little gesture which took in the whole market women he was the child of the halle living first with one of the women and then with another dressed no one precisely knew how but always having a few sous in his pocket a beautiful girl who sold plants called him marjolin no one knew why but the name was adopted marjolin was four when mother chantemesse found in her turn a little girl on the sidewalk outside of the market the child could not have been more than two but she chattered like a magpie in her childish dialect the woman thought she called herself cadine and said that her mother had told her to wait for her but the little girl was quite ready to go with mother chantemesse and seemed delighted with the crowd and all the pretty vegetables mother chantemesse was a goodish sort of woman about sixty who adored children and had lost three of her own and she adopted cadine one evening as the old woman was walking through the market leading cadine by the right hand marjolin came up and took the child's left hand without the smallest ceremony well well said the old woman you are too late your place is taken but when the little fellow smiled in her face it was too much for her and she said to him come on one may as well have two as one i suppose and she walked home leading the two children whom she put to bed in an old hand-cart without wheels which if it was a little hard was clean thus did the two little imps grow up together and became inseparable mother chantemesse heard them talking together softly in the night cadine in her baby voice would tell the most wonderful stories to which marjolin would listen in mute amazement she invented stories as she grew older which filled him with terror she was once heard to say that the night before she had seen a tall man all in white standing at the foot of their bed looking at them and when marjolin piteously begged for further details she laughed delightedly and called him a great simpleton for a long time their bed was their playroom cadine took her dolls there and there their white teeth crunched stolen turnips each morning their adopted mother was astonished to find leaves and stones apple cores and bundles of paper rolled up to imitate dolls on rainy days or very cold days they remained in bed half the day and slept as much as they could this room in la rue de la lingerie was a large attic lighted by one window only the children played hide-and-seek there in the tall wardrobe and under the colossal bed there were two or three tables under which they could crawl the house had a succession of gutters into which the children threw stones with such success that they broke two windows and mother chantemesse was requested to leave cadine and marjolin spent much of their time in the streets which they fearlessly threaded when it rained they walked gravely side by side under an umbrella which was all in slits having been used for twenty years to shelter a vegetable stand they planted it in a corner of the market and called it their house on sunny warm days they bathed their feet in the gutter made little dams across it with stones hid among the vegetables and stayed there all night sometimes they would be caught by the delighted chuckle which came from a mountain of lettuces and when they were rooted out they looked like scared birds discovered amid the bushes cadine could not live without marjolin and marjolin wept when he lost cadine when they became separated they always looked for each other first among the cabbages which they seemed to prefer to all other vegetables marjolin was eight and cadine six when mother chantemesse first made them feel ashamed of their idleness she promised them each a sou per day if they would help repair her vegetables this was the specialty of mother chantemesse on her table were piled little heaps of potatoes turnips and carrots scraped and peeled ready to pop into the pot of some hurried housewife she also had soup herbs tied up and bundles ready for the pot au feu four leeks three carrots one parsnip two turnips and some celery tops then too there were vegetables cut fine lying on paper ready for a julienne cadine was much more skilful than marjolin although younger her potato parings were so thin that one could see the light through them 
and she tied up her herbs in so graceful a fashion that they looked like bouquets and made the small piles look like larger ones so skilfully did she arrange them people as they passed stopped at the clear childish voice which saluted them buy of me madame buy of me only two sous she had her own customers soon her little piles had quite a reputation and mother chantemesse seated between the children laughed silently at seeing them so intent on their work she paid them each their sou every night but they soon grew weary of their undertaking and determined to enlarge their operations and find more lucrative employment marjolin remained a child a long time much to cadine's annoyance who called him a cabbage head there was some truth in what she said for he had no faculty for making money while she was very clever when she was eight years old she was employed by one of the women who sold lemons and oranges near the market to run after people with them in her hands she received two sous for every dozen she sold and often made six or eight sous the next year she sold caps when her profits were larger the difficulty here was that not being allowed to sell them openly as such commerce is forbidden she was obliged to evade the police she saw them a square off the caps went under her petticoats and when they reached her she was eating an apple with the most innocent air after this she sold cakes galettes and cherry tarts biscuits de maize thick and yellow but marjolin ate too much of her stock at eleven she realized a great idea that had tormented her for some time she had saved four francs and she bought a little basket and began to sell chickweed this was a great event she rose early and bought her chickweed and her branches of millet and then she went as far as the luxembourg marjolin with her but she would not let him carry the basket he was only good to cry her wares she said and he shouted until he was hoarse chickweed chickweed for the little birds and then she would take up the cry and in a strange musical phrase would call chickweed chickweed for the little birds at this time marjolin wore a huge red vest which had belonged to the defunct father chantemesse who had driven a fiacre cadine's dress was a blue and white check cut from a tartan once worn by mother chantemesse all the canary birds in the quartier latin knew them and would answer to their cry by fluttering wings and an eager chirp cadine sold watercresses also two sous for a basket only two sous the central halle were now being built and the little girl was carried away by the long alley of flowers which crossed the fruit market there she saw two thick hedges of roses and drank in the perfume with exquisite delight she held her curly head under marjolin's nose and he vowed she should never use any more pomade she finally managed so cleverly that she obtained a position at one of the flower stands and lived from morning until night among roses and lilacs wallflowers and lilies of the valley marjolin to tease her would catch the hem of her dress and smell of it to be sure he would say lilies of the valley then he would snuff at her shoulders wallflowers he added sententiously he would hold her hands up high smell of them lilies my dear and your lips are roses cadine laughed called him a goose and told him to let her be but in truth she was a living bouquet the girl rose at four to help her mistress at work each morning there were huge baskets of flowers brought in packages of moss periwinkle and ferns on fete days their labors began at two o'clock when more than one hundred thousand francs worth of cut flowers were sold in the market on such days only cadine's pretty curly head was to be seen among her pansies mignonettes and marguerites she was lost among the flowers in a very short time she had acquired not only skill but exhibited great originality her bouquets did not please everybody by any means they were even disagreeable to some persons reds predominated combined with yellows and blues in a barbaric sort of way on those mornings when the girl had teased marjolin until he was ready to weep her bouquets were more than ever fiery in colour other days when she was moved by some joy or some sorrow her bouquets were soft and tender they were roses then or white carnations tawny gladioli like patches of flame among feathery verdure a tapestry of smyrna patiently imitated flower by flower or fans gracefully spread and soft as lace dreams of loveliness to place in the hands of a graceful woman or a pure young girl 
all the strange fancies were those of a child in whom the woman was just awakening cadine respected only two things lilacs a bunch of which six or eight sprays cost in winter from fifteen to twenty francs and camellias which are dearer still and which come from the florists in boxes of a dozen each on a bed of moss covered with cotton wool she took them up as she would have handled jewels with the most delicate care hardly venturing to breathe lest she should tarnish their exquisite beauty and with infinite precautions put a fine wire through their short stems she spoke of them with great deference telling marjolin that a white camellia without a brown or rusty stain was a very rare thing one morning when she was trying to make him admire one he said oh yes it is pretty but not half as pretty as the skin under your chin it is no whiter and not half as smooth he touched her with the tips of his fingers and then added everything about you to-day smells of orange blossoms cadine was not very amiable nor a very submissive little servant and consequently established herself on her own account as soon as she could which of course was at first only on a very small scale she sold boutonnieres of violets for a sou which were stuck in a flat basket she spent her days in the hall this was her great delight and she arranged her violets as she walked with wonderful dexterity she counted six or eight flowers according to the season added a leaf or two and wound around them a damp thread which she bit off with her sharp white teeth her basket was always full no matter how many she sold so quick was she in making them no matter how rudely she was jostled in the crowded streets her rapid fingers moved while her eyes were occupied with the shop windows sometimes she sat down for a while in a doorway and gave to the very gutter wherein the dirty water ran a look of spring her boutonnieres indicated her mood some were fierce and bristling others sweet and tender wherever she went she left behind her an odour of the country and marjolaine told her she was herself one big violet the girl made no further changes she adhered to the flower business but as the two children grew up she occasionally left her osier basket at home and went off with marjolaine exploring the hall and its cellars they knew its every corner and dim recess and were thoroughly at home with the sleeping giant cadine and marjolaine had outgrown the old handcart in the attic of mother chantemesse the old woman had sent the boy to a neighbor's to sleep but the children were unhappy at the separation and liked to curl up together behind the food stalls in the market and as they grew older they often slept in the cellar and among the baskets of feathers enjoying the sense of companionship in the most utter innocence but later they lived like young and happy animals cadine at sixteen was a thorough bohemienne selfish sensual and greedy marjolet at eighteen was dull of intellect but good-natured if a little blasé cadine laughed impudently in the face of mother chantemesse when the old woman asked her where she had spent the night when the girl was not with marjolin he slept anywhere among the old boxes but he never left the hall it was there they spent their lives but their great delight was in the especial market devoted to butter eggs and cheeses where every morning piles of empty baskets were found they selected an enormous one and called it their house there they lay unsuspected by any one and shook with laughter when people stopped near them to talk without suspecting their presence cadine in cherry time armed herself with any amount of stones which she threw at the noses of all the old women who passed which was all the better fun for them as the poor old things could not divine whence came the hailstorm they amused themselves by following the track of the subterranean railway the deserted avenues with its streaks of daylight coming through the gratings the dark corners lighted by gas the whole place seemed to belong to them occasionally on moonlight nights they climbed upon the roofs by the narrow staircase at each angle and found a wide field of zinc spread before them but they did not stop here they went still higher until only the sky was above them at this height the air was very pure the wind swept away all the bad odors from the market and at daybreak they sat on the edge of the roof by the gutters with the sparrows cadine laughed aloud with a sound like the cooing of a dove marjolet when they came down said they had been in the country it was at the tripe market that they first made the acquaintance of claude lantier they went there every day they liked to watch the carts drive up 
they looked at the lamb's feet which were piled up like dirty paving stones the huge red tongues and bullocks hearts they shivered as they saw the bloody heads and thought of a guillotine but fascinated followed them to the cellar and saw them broken one by one by the butchers with a mallet and the brains taken out toward evening between four and five cadine and marjolin were sure of meeting claude who was in an ecstasy at the beauty of colouring the painter became the great friend of the two gamins he contemplated a colossal picture of the two young lovers in the market among the meats vegetables and fish he dreamed of an artistic manifesto of the positivism of art modern art experimental and materialistic and hoped thus to satirize the painter of ideas and to strike a blow at the old school for more than two years he had made studies for this purpose but had not yet found the keynote he had commenced a dozen canvases but was dissatisfied with all and felt a certain spite against his two models on account of his unpainted picture wherever he saw them however he joined them and the three roamed the streets together all in a row compelling the people they met to turn out for them they learned to know each corner by its odours the wine shop the pastry cooks and the bakers when they wandered through the wide new streets la rue du pont neuf and la rue des halles he orated to the gamins on their beauty and magnificence on the birth of a new era which he felt to be near at hand an era of originality but cadine and marjolin preferred the provincial quiet of la rue des bourdonnais where they could play marbles on the curbstones without danger of being walked on they preferred those portions of old paris which were still left standing les rues de la poterie et de la lingerie with their swelled front houses and narrow dark shops they liked to loiter at the windows and adore the sweetmeats the boxes of prunes and the candies in the confectioners windows there was one shop where soap was manufactured where marjolin always stopped to catch the fragrance which came from the door as it was opened cadine insisted on looking at the barrels of anchovies and capers at a great warehouse huge jars of pickled cucumbers and olives with their wooden spoons she liked the smell of pickled salmon of hams and dried herring and smacked her lips at the sight of the boxes of sardines in la rue coquillere they caught the smell of truffles and there cadine and marjolin shut their eyes and pretended they were eating the most delicious things claude laughed at them called them simpletons and said he should leave them to dine on the smell of truffles cadine when she was alone did not extend her walk so far she had a weakness for certain places for an especial pastry cook who displayed in la rue sur bigot almond cakes savans babas and eclairs custards and creams and looked with longing eyes on the macaroons and madeleines the bakery with its clean marble counters was almost as attractive and yielding to temptation she would go in and buy a brioche for two sous another shop opposite the square des innocents made her mouth water and she vowed to herself that the day would come when she would eat her fill of the delicacies there displayed cadine also felt a longing for pretty things to wear as well as to eat and as she walked would select a pale blue or green silk as that which she would like and in the evening lingered before the jewellers in la rue montmartre whose windows blazed with the white light of silver and the yellow hue of gold the watches bracelets and rings did not tempt her as much as the silver thimbles which covered a globe she selected however some earrings of imitation coral which she regarded as altogether the most beautiful things there one morning claude found her transfixed before the window of a coiffeur in la rue st honore she was looking with evident longing at the display of hair in all hues from the palest blonde to the densest black in the midst of which a woman's bust was slowly revolving the woman wore a scarf of cherry satin fastened by a brass breastpin and the hair was dressed as a bride's very high with orange blossoms the mouth wore a simple smile and the eyelashes were stiff and preposterously long but cadine was completely fascinated by this beautiful creature claude was furious he shook cadine and asked her what she found to admire in that bust which looked as if it had come from the morgue cadine and marjolin had made the acquaintance of leon the apprentice of the Quenu gradel they saw him as he carried a tray to some customer select a quiet corner and there lift the covers and try each dish in succession they at once felt him to be one of themselves and cadine determined to know him and enjoy these delicacies with him on some future occasion 
she invited him to a breakfast which she gave in a corner of the market sheltered from public observation by a rampart of empty baskets the table was a flat basket turned bottom upwards they had pears nuts cheese and shrimps fried potatoes and radishes the cheese came from a fruiterer's in la rue de la cossonnerie and was a present she had purchased two cents worth of fried potatoes on credit the rest of the feast she had stolen it was a regal repast and leon not wishing to be outdone returned the civility by a supper and gave them cold blood pudding sausages pickles and ham the charcuterie of the quenu gradelle had provided everything from this time suppers and breakfasts were constantly interchanged never were young people happier marjolin constantly provided sweet surprises for cadine in the way of delicacies which he stole for her delectation he had become very skilful in this respect and helped himself like magic as he walked between the stalls notwithstanding his success however the friteur was beginning to make loud complaints this friteur whom cadine patronized had his little stall supported against the side of a tottering wall held up by moss-covered beams and cadine owed him thirty sous and was quite crushed by the debt how could she ever pay it she did not count on marjolin she never did she felt herself compelled to return leon's politeness and was quite ashamed that she could never offer him any meat he had served them an entire ham at a time he had all the things which the shop could furnish but no bread and nothing to drink marjolin saw leon kiss the girl one night but he only laughed he was not jealous of her claude never assisted at these festivities he had caught cadine one day stealing a bunch of beets and had pulled her ear as well she should not do this he said and yet he felt a certain sense of amusement at seeing these happy animals picking up the crumbs of this abundance marjolin was in gavard's employment and had little to do save to hear his master's interminable tales while cadine continued to sell her violets marjolin left her very often to look through the windows at madame quenu he experienced in looking at her a sensation as if he had eaten something that he liked and he left the window eager to see her again he dreamed of her every night and contrived to see her nearly every day as she had now taken upon herself the task of going to market and passed gavard's shop on her way the truth was her instinct taught her that she was more likely to induce him to speak openly to her in his own shop than in hers where he was on his guard but in his he was quite willing to orate she determined to discover from him what took place at m lebigre's for in mademoiselle saget she did not place unbounded confidence she was appalled at what gavard told her and two days after the explanation she had had with quenu she came in from market very pale she made a sign to her husband to follow her into the dining-room she closed the doors and then turned toward him your brother then is determined to send us all to the scaffold is he why do you have any concealments from me quenu swore that he did not know what she meant and then promised her never to set foot again inside the cabaret she shrugged her shoulders you will do wisely she answered unless you wish to leave your skin there florent will get himself into trouble i see it i feel it then after a moment's silence she added more calmly what a foolish fellow he is he might live here in the clover if he chose but no he must dabble in politics he will ruin himself and us too quenu this must end i told you so you remember quenu caught his breath he knew what was coming he shall eat here no more she said it is enough for him to sleep here he makes money let him buy his own food quenu tried to protest but she closed his lips by exclaiming then choose between him and us i swear to you that i will take my daughter and go away if he remains i shall speak the plain truth to you now he is in my opinion a bad man who has brought only trouble into our home but i will soon settle it you must choose between him and me quenu was breathless and she left him and returned to the shop where she weighed out a half pound of pate de foie with her affable smile gavard in a hot political discussion to which she had adroitly led up had said that she would soon see strange things and made several veiled allusions which disturbed her greatly her imagination at once depicted armed police picking up quenu pauline and herself by the napes of their necks and incarcerating them in a prison 
she was icy in her demeanour that night toward florent she did not help him to any dish on the table and said several times it is strange how much bread we eat lately florent at last understood that he was treated like a poor relation of whom one wishes to get rid he had worn quenu's old clothes for the last two months and as quenu was fat and he thin the effect of these garments was most remarkable lisa also handed him over her husband's old linen the ragged towels and sheets were sent to his room and he no longer was treated in other ways with the consideration which had been shown him little pauline made remarks which wounded him in regard to the shabbiness of his garments these remarks about the bread were more than he could endure quenu did not look up and pretended not to notice what was going on florent however did not know how to get away for a week he tried to find words in which to say that he thought he should prefer to take his meals elsewhere his gentle nature cherished the illusion that he should wound his brother and sister-in-law by this proposition he was unwilling to admit even to himself the hostility which lisa felt toward him nor did he once think so great was his unselfishness of his money which his sister-in-law held in her hand he thought with what remained to him of his salary and with the proceeds of the lessons he gave one pupil that he could spend eighteen sous for his breakfast and twenty-six for his dinner at last one morning he said that as he found it impossible to be punctual at his meals that he would take them when and where he could he coloured as he said this la belle lisa was cold and stately which troubled him greatly she had determined not to take the initiative but to wait until he spoke himself and now she should get rid of him without any disagreeable scene but quenu exclaimed in some agitation eat just where you please my dear fellow you will remember however that it is your own fault if you go you will dine with us sometimes on sunday however florent hastily left the room for his heart was very full and lisa when alone with quenu did not venture to reproach him for the weakness of which he had been guilty in this invitation for sundays she was victorious and she drew a long sigh of satisfaction and wanted to burn some sugar to get rid of the fishy smell which she said haunted her at the end of a week she was not as well satisfied she saw florent very rarely and she took it into her head that he was manufacturing some infernal machine up in the attic or arranging some system of signals from his window gavard was apparently despondent he left his shop in marjolin's care for a day at a time and fidgeted to and fro la belle lisa determined on a master blow she knew that florent had asked for a few days holiday and proposed to pass them with claude lantier at nanterre with madame francois lisa went to invite gavard to dinner but she could not find him marjolin was alone in the shop End of chapter four part one chapter four part two of the markets of paris by emile zola this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chickweed for the Little Birds, Part Two. High above his head hung fat geese and dead rabbits with frightened eyes. Pigeons and ducks, as yet unplucked, were on the counter. Three superb turkeys, specked with blue, like a chin that has been freshly shaved, lay on their backs, while in plates were the livers, hearts, and gizzards, claws, necks, and pinions marjolin among all this food with his smooth glossy skin looked as if he too were good to eat when he saw la belle lisa he started from his lounging position he was always more or less timid in her presence and stammered in reply to her question that he did not know where m gavard was he had been there an hour before but had gone away without saying when he would return she stooped to caress a rabbit in a box saying as she did so do you not think you could find him he may be in the poultry rooms in the cellar answered marjolin i will wait for him then said lisa or better still why can't i go down there i have wanted to go for five years and you will show me the way will you not the youth stammered forth a confused expression of willingness to do anything she desired but the heavy air of the cellar suffocated la belle charcutière she stood on the steps and looked up at the arched ceiling and at the heavy columns she hesitated on account of the penetrating odour the exhalation from living creatures which scorched her throat with their alkalis the smell is horrible she said it would not be healthy to live here i am perfectly well madame 
said marjolet much astonished the smell is not so bad when one is accustomed to it she followed him saying that the smell disgusted her with fowls and she should not want to eat any for two months the poultry houses stood in straight lines with occasional gaslights between and the aspect was that of a village at midnight when all its inhabitants are asleep at each corner was a long blue board on which were inscribed the names of the tenants monsieur gavard is away at the back said the young man they turned into a dark corner but no gavard was to be seen never mind madame i will show you the fowls myself for i have a key la belle lisa followed and stumbled against him if you think she said that i can see anything in this darkness you are very much mistaken he did not reply instantly but at last stammered that there was always a candle inside that he could light but he fumbled a long time over the lock she tried to assist him and felt his breath hot on her neck when he lighted the candle she saw that his hands trembled simpleton she cried the idea of getting into such a state of excitement because a door can't be opened i should think you were a nervous girl gavard had hired two compartments and made them into one poultry room by taking away the partitions turkeys geese and ducks were picking in the dung heaps while on shelves built in three rows one above another were boxes with gratings over them containing chickens and rabbits the place was incredibly dirty and hung with grey spiders webs but lisa was too civil to show her disgust she looked into the boxes and compassionated the poor chickens who were shut out from the light of day and could not even stand and move about the young man showed her a duck whose leg was broken and said they should kill him that evening for fear he would die during the night but she said when do they eat he explained that they did not eat without light and that he or gavard was obliged to light a candle and wait until the creatures had got through their meals i like to watch them he continued it is droll to see them fight sometimes i shade the light with my hand and they stand perfectly still and then put their heads under their wings as if the sun had set it is against the regulations to go away and leave a light here one of the poultry women nearly set the place on fire the other day your poultry require a good deal of waiting on said lisa if they must have a candle lighted for each meal as she spoke she passed out of the room raising her skirts from out of the filth he blew out the candle and locked the door she hurried on not liking to be left with this youth in the darkness when he joined her she said i am glad to have seen this there are certainly many odd things under the hall i am very much obliged but i must hurry home now if monsieur gavard comes in pray tell him that i must speak to him at once he is probably at the abattage answered marjolin let us go and see she did not reply the close air of the place made her very uncomfortable and it annoyed her to have marjolin so close to her he breathed hard too as if the air affected him also she stepped back a little and motioned to him to precede her she fancied that her companion guided her in a very roundabout way when they came out in front of the underground railway he told her that he wanted to show it to her they stood for a few moments looking through the beams of the protecting wall on their way back they found mother palette in front of her poultry house taking the cords off a large basket from which a furious noise of wings and claws were heard when she loosened the last knot the geese within raised the cover with their powerful heads and escaped running and flying with loud hisses which resounded through the arched cellar lisa could not help laughing while the poultry woman swore like a pirate and succeeded in catching two while marjolin started in pursuit of a third he was heard running at full speed laughing and much amused by this unlooked-for frolic then there was a sound of a struggle and he soon returned with the bird mother palette an old yellow woman took it and held it for a moment in the position of the antique leda i don't know i am sure what i should have done marjolin if you had not been here the other day i fought with one but i had my knife and cut its throat at last marjolin was all out of breath and lisa caught a strange light in his eyes as together they reached the abattage generally he dropped his eyes when she spoke to him for the first time she realized his superb beauty his square shoulders and his bright complexion and blonde hair she looked at him with the frank admiration which women often fearlessly evince toward very young men he became once more timid and embarrassed you see that monsieur gavard is not here she said and i am wasting my time he explained to her the abattage 
showed her the huge blocks of stone lighted by gas one woman was plucking chickens which led him to say that they often plucked them alive because it was so much easier he told her to take up a handful of the feathers which were piled up there and said they were sold at nine sous the pound she put her hand into the baskets of down he called her attention to the water faucets at each pillar and told her that all spots of blood were washed up every two hours by men whose especial duty it was he added that in great rainstorms the water often invaded these cellars once to the height of three centimetres on which occasion he was obliged to take all his poultry to the upper end he laughed as he described the fright of the creatures he finished by showing her the ventilators which carried off all bad odours this seemed to her a ridiculous thing to say so thoroughly was the air impregnated by the ammoniated smell of the guano marjolin seemed in a state of suppressed excitement and was no longer timid you are a good boy said la belle lisa to have shown me all this when you come to my shop i will give you something forgetting his age and remembering only that she had known him since his babyhood she took him by the chin as she spoke if her hand lingered it was unconsciously though she was by no means as calm as usual herself he at this caress glanced quickly around assured himself that no one was near and caught la belle lisa by the waist and threw her into a huge crate of feathers she pale and trembling at this brutal attack sprang up and raised her large round arms and struck a blow just such as she had seen struck at the abattoir fair between the eyes he fell and his head struck one of the stones at this moment a cock crowed loudly la belle lisa was chilled through and through her lips were white over her head she heard the dull roar of the halle through the gratings came the street sounds and she thought that only the strength of her own arms had saved her she shook off the feathers that had adhered to her skirts fearing to be seen and without a glance at marjolin she hurried to the staircase daylight and the fresh air were a great relief she entered her shop perfectly calm and only a little paler than usual where have you been so long said quenu looking for gavard she answered quietly i could not find him and we must eat our leg of mutton without him she filled up several pots with lard prepared some chops for her friend madame tabouraud whose little servant was waiting as she broke the bones with her mallet she thought of marjolin lying in the cellar but felt no pang of self-reproach she had only done her duty she looked at quenu he certainly was very plain and his skin was very rough and his chin far from velvety while the skin and the chin of the other were like down she said to herself with a sigh that it was a pity for children to grow up so fast quenu was struck by her beauty you ought to go out oftener he said if you wish we will go to the theatre sometimes to the gaieté where madame tabouraud saw that play she liked so much lisa smiled and said she would see and then went out again quenu thought she was very good to run after gavard in that way but she had only gone upstairs to florent's room the key of which hung on a nail in the kitchen she hoped as she could not get hold of gavard to make some discoveries here she went about the room examined the bed and looked at the mantel-shelf the window was open and the plants were drinking in the soft air she could not find the smallest trace of florent's presence she was astonished at this she touched augustine's dress still hanging in the corner and then took a seat at the table reading a half-finished page in which the word revolution occurred several times she was frightened at this and opened the door which she saw was full of papers she sat looking at them when the bird uttered a long shrill cry she started and realized the ignominy of the act she was about to commit she closed the drawer she went to the window and standing there said to herself that she would take counsel of the abbe roustan a man of good sound sense as she mechanically looked down on the square below she beheld cadine weeping in the centre of a crowd while florent and claude were talking earnestly together a little apart she hurried downstairs surprised at their speedy return hardly was she established behind her counter than mademoiselle saget entered saying come and see poor marjolin madame he was found in the cellar unconscious and a great gash cut in his head lisa hurried across the street the youth lay with his eyes closed and his fair hair stained with blood someone among the crowd said it was nothing that it was his own fault that he was always foolhardy and jumping over the tables at the abattage 
this was one of his favourite amusements and he had undoubtedly fallen in that way mademoiselle saget pointed to the weeping cadine probably that little scamp pushed him they are always in mischief marjolin revived by the fresh air opened his eyes he caught sight of lisa's face bending over him and smiled faintly he did not seem to remember anything that had taken place lisa said calmly that he ought to be taken at once to the hospital she would go and see him and carry him some delicacies he was put on a litter and cadine followed it still with her wicker tray suspended around her neck and her bunches of violets stuck into the moss which she watered with her hot tears as lisa entered her shop she heard claude say to florent as they were separating that boy has spoiled my day but we did have a good time claude and florent had indeed brought back with them something of the fresh air of the country that morning before daybreak they went to find madame francois who had just sold her last vegetable they then the three together went to the compadre in the rue montorgueil for the wagon this was almost a foretaste of the country behind the restaurant philippe whose gorgeous gilding illuminated the entire lower floor was a regular farmyard smelling of fresh straw and warm dung young chickens and hens picked the soft earth stalls and sheds of all sorts and sizes were built against the neighbouring houses balthazar all harnessed was eating his oats comfortably under shelter he was nevertheless quite ready to return to nanterre but he did not go back unloaded the market woman had made a bargain with the company who had contracted to keep the hall clean she carried home with her three times in the week a load of refuse taken up with a pitchfork from the heap swept together in the centre of the square which was a valuable addition to her manure heap claude and florent lay on the coarse sheet she spread over these green leaves madame francois took the reins and balthazar started forth his head a little low on the account of the unusual burthen he carried this visit had been long talked of the market woman was as gay as a lark she liked the two men and promised them such a breakfast as they had never eaten in that miserable place paris and they enjoyed the prospect of the long idle day before them are you comfortable asked madame francois as she turned into la rue pont neuf yes as cosy as two peas in a pod answered claude gaily he lay on his back watching the stars paling in the sky and the growing light in the east they listened to the good woman talking to balthazar take your ease old fellow she said softly we are in no such great hurry they reached the champs elysees and the painter saw trees on either side and beyond the green mass of the gardens of the tuileries as they passed the rue du roule he looked at the side door of saint eustache in the distance do you know he said suddenly that iron is destined to kill stone it is not by accident that we see saint eustache through one of the long avenues of les halles it is a fatality it is modern art realism nature whatever you may choose to call it which has grown up in the face of ancient art you do not agree with me as florent did not speak he continued this church is not a pure architecture the moyen age is dying in it and the renaissance is not yet on its feet but have you noticed the churches which are built in these times they are like observatories libraries hospitals like anything in fact but churches and it would be difficult to convince me that le bon dieu looks upon them as suitable the masons who loved him are dead and it would be wiser not to erect any more of these ugly constructions since the beginning of this century but one original monument has been built the natural outgrowth of the epoch and this is the hall these markets i tell you are a timid revelation of the spirit of the twentieth century and this is why saint eustache is nearly obscured there it stands empty while the hall have grown up around it crowded with life look at balthazar said madame francois laughing the woman who brought you safely into the world earned her money for you make even animals listen to you when you speak the carriage went slowly on at this early hour the avenue was deserted there were no rows of chairs on the sidewalk and the turf lay dark under the trees at the rond point a lady and gentleman on horseback passed and florent closed his eyes the better to enjoy the sweetness of the fresh breeze he was happy in getting away from the halles happy to breathe an air uncontaminated by the smell of food they say continued claude 
that industry kills poetry and the fools weep over flowers as if any one proposed to hurt the flowers these people fret me to death i want to answer their moans by a work which they must needs accept as a defiance it would amuse me to startle these good people a little shall i tell you the thing which pleases me best of all i have ever done in my life it is quite a story last year on christmas eve i was at my aunt lisa's and that goose of a fellow auguste was dressing the shop windows and the counters i looked on until i could bear it no longer and told him i would do it myself you see i had all the strong colours i required the red of the tongues the yellow of the small hams blue in the paper pink in the delicate slices which were cut green in the carrot and lettuce leaves and such a black as i could never find on my palette in the blood puddings the sausages chitterlings and breaded pig's feet gave me delicious tones of grey i made a superb thing of it i took my dishes plates jars and bottles and massed them together i arrayed the tongues so that they looked like scarlet flames and a large truffled turkey lay in the centre i tell you it was simply superb and the crowd that gathered before the window thought the same but aunt lisa when she appeared was quite shocked and bade auguste arrange the window as usual and of course he did not grasp the idea of the reds being brought out by the greys and of course it was hopeless to try and make him see it never mind it was the best thing i ever did claude sank into silence smiling at his thoughts the wagon had reached the arc de triomphe the wind blew strongly down the various open avenues around the immense square florent leaned out and drank in the breath of the green grass which blew toward him from the fortifications at the top of la rue de longchamp madame Francois showed him the place where she had picked him up he fell into a deep reverie and as he looked at the market-woman he thought her look of health and benignant sweetness of expression made her more beautiful than lisa when they reached nanterre the carriage turned to the left and entered a narrow lane running along the walls and stopped in an enclosure from which there was no outlet it was the end of the world the market-woman said there they were to leave their load of cabbage leaves and green stuff claude and florent bade the boy who was planting out lettuce to go on with his work while they armed with pitchforks threw out the heap this amused them and claude had a good deal to say about the refuse from the market being sent back again in the form of new generations of vegetables and fruits paris consumed everything returned everything to the earth which in due time repaired all damages there is a cabbage stump which i recognize said claude as he took up the last on his pitchfork this is the tenth time at the very least that it has grown up in that corner by the apricot tree florent laughed but his smiles faded as he walked on claude was making a sketch and madame Francois was preparing breakfast this garden was a long narrow strip from the extremity of which he could see the low casemates of mont valerien which were divided by row after row of evergreen hedges from the little garden of madame Francois. a great peace brooded over the landscape the may sunshine had brought out insect life and a gentle humming of bees fell upon the stillness the garden was laid off in squares sorrel and spinach radishes carrots and beets cabbages and potatoes stood in regular lines while peas and beans were sunning out their slender tendrils not a weed was to be seen the ground looked as if it were swept every morning borders of thyme put a grey fringe to the two sides of the wide path florent enjoyed this breath of thyme brought out by the hot sun he loved the country and all growing things for a year he had seen none except those torn from the ground he liked to see the vegetables here whole and hearty the cabbages were luxuriant the carrots were gay and the salads looked contented and crisp the markets which he had left behind him he looked back upon as a vast cemetery where only dead things lay the noise and the smell of the fish market seemed to him a thing of the past yes claude was right the earth was life the cradle and the health of the world your omelette is ready cried the market woman from the door when the three sat round the table with the sunshine streaming in at the open door they were all so gay that madame Francois looked at florent in astonishment i declare she said you are ten years younger your eyes have a laugh in them that i never saw there before you ought not to live in a city come and live here but claude interfered 
he said that paris was superb he even defended the gutters although he admitted that he adored the country in the afternoon florent and madame francois were alone in a corner of the garden where a few fruit trees were planted she was giving him some maternal advice she asked him what he meant to do with himself and her questions evidently arose from friendly interest with no admixture of curiosity he was deeply touched for no woman had ever before shown so much interest in him she reminded him of a healthy out-of-door plant while lisa claire and la normande were doubtful and arranged for sale so to speak about five o'clock the two men started for paris they were going to walk and madame francois went to the end of the lane with them she there took florent's hand come here she said if you are ever in sorrow for a half hour florent walked on in silence feeling that he left health safety and happiness behind him the road was white with dust clouds of which arose each time they brought their feet down the sun was low and their shadows stretched far upon the opposite sidewalk claude with swinging arms took long regular strides and looked at their shadows then arousing himself as if from a dream he said do you know the battle of the fat and the lean florent said no in some surprise whereupon claude went off into an enthusiastic praise of this series of engravings he described certain ones the fat men enormously stout preparing for their evening gourmandizing while the thin men bowed by fasting looked in from the street with covetous eyes and then again the fat ones at table with cheeks stuffed full dismissing a lean one who had been audacious enough to enter and who looked like a needle among bullets he saw in this the drama of human life and ended by classifying men into the fat and the lean natural enemies where the one devoured the other you may be sure he said that cain was fat and abel thin ever since the first murder there has always been a constant battle of the strong against the weak each swallowing his neighbour and being swallowed in turn so look out my boy distrust fat people as a rule he relapsed into silence and watched their shadows we are the thin ones you see tell me as flat as we are with no bellies to speak of ought we to claim much sunshine florent smiled but claude was in earnest you may laugh he continued but it is no laughing matter if i were fat i should paint quietly have a fine studio and sell my pictures for their weight in gold instead of that i am thin and when i die i shall probably be put between two leaves of a book instead of having a coffin bought in which to bury me decently as would be the case were i double my weight but you are worse than i you are really the king of lean men do you remember the day you quarrelled with the fishwomen it was a magnificent sight their heaving breasts and broad shoulders in contrast to your meagre form they acted as i tell you their instinct was to drive the thin man from among them for the fat dislike and distrust the thin and were i you i should act on these suggestions the canoes are fat so are the mahoudans in fact you are surrounded by fat people i should get out of it if i were you and gavard mademoiselle saget and your friend marjolin what of them asked florent still smiling oh i will classify all your acquaintances if you say so i have had every one of their heads in my portfolio for a long time with the indication of the order to which they belong it is a chapter of natural history gavard is a fat man but wishes to be included among the thin that is quite a common variety mademoiselle saget and madame lecoeur are thin and much to be feared as they are ready to commit any enormity in order to be enrolled among the fat while marjolin cadine and la serviette are among the fat but they are as yet so young that their worst qualities are not developed it is worthy of remark that the young belonging to the fat class are altogether charming your political acquaintances of course are among the thin the painter rambled on in this way all the way from the pont de neuilly to the arc de triomphe but where do you place madame francois said florent finally claude was considerably embarrassed by this question he hesitated madame francois madame francois no i do not know just where to place her she is a good woman and that is enough they both laughed at this moment they stood before the arc de triomphe the sun was so low in the horizon that their colossal shadows fell upon the monument 
higher even than the enormous statues like two dark stains see here cried claude as he took his friend's arm if we go on like this when the sun has set our two heads will touch the sky but florent laughed no more paris had reabsorbed him that paris which ever since his sojourn at cayenne he had regarded with terror and distrust when he reached the halle the smells were suffocating and he bowed his head ready to take up again the burthen of his nightmare haunted by a longing for the country and the breath of time End of chapter four